I have to mention that that weekend encompasses Michael's turning 70. Yes, I said oh, 70. Oh, the cat's out of the bag. Yeah. People thought I was about 45. Yeah, 70, the new 50, <laughs> when worn by Michael James. About the 60s. So, uh, with That's all why of that. That's I can talk about the 60s. <laughs> yes, it's time to talk about the 60s. Ted Morgan uh, has written one heck of a dense, intelligent, and long needed, I think, book that. Uh, that really looks at the mythology that has developed since the 60s and, and uh, uh, with a, a scalpel goes into what the media and society and the political apparatus um, did with what we lived through. So, and Ted. <laughs> Ted, also known as Edward, <laughs> uh, what is uh, the general thesis of your book? Just put it out there for us. Well, um, basically, the I argue that historically, after the Second World War, um, the elites in this country decided to revive capitalism with the military-industrial complex um, and with consumer demand, and that that created a society, the contradictions within which um, produced the social movements of the 60s. They were rising up against the various contradictions in that world. Um, those movements in the 60s then um, were influenced not only by events but by the way the media covered them in ways which produced uh, turmoil, uh, a threat to these elites and a threat to the system that <clears throat> then produced a backlash against that, uh, the movements of the 60s. And since the 60s, the media have, the commercial media have kind of exploited the 60s uh, for profit or for attracting audiences or attracting consumers. Um, you can think of a million movies which are sort of played on stereotypes of the 60s, TV shows, advertisements and the like. At the same time, the backlash, the ideological backlash attacked the 60s, blamed the movements of the 60s on liberals, whether that was the liberal administration or liberal parents or liberal media or what have you. And they created a kind of a populist spin for themselves, even though they really represented the, the richest of the rich, the corporations and so forth. What we now call the 1%. What we now call the 1%. That produced the world we live in. And we've yeah. been living in it since 1980. Well, as a guy who uh, came up in the 60s and was active in the 60s, um, I kind of, I've always thought of it as, uh, you know, we had the Second World War, we had people coming back from the Second World War, there was a lot of opportunity, the Marshall Plan was going on in Europe, uh, the U.S. Uh, was growing, it became the, uh, the number one economic force in the world, it became the imperialist power in the world, had a lot of commitments. Uh, there were also rising expectations on behalf, on the part of uh, uh, the GIs coming home, people in general, the economy seemed to expand. And, um, but then uh, all of the goals and the perceived opportunities weren't necessarily there, particularly for black people, third world people, and uh, people began to take initiative. Uh, I think that the key to the women's movement, the peace movement, all kind of movements really comes from the role that black people played uh, and the stand that they took. Uh, so share a little bit about uh, how we uh, how we ended up with a uh, with those rising expectations, with a, a movement for change in the streets, and uh, how we evolved back into a backlash that has been with us even to today. Okay. Well, that would require reading the book. <laughs> of course. That's why we saved a long time for. <laughs> you have a few hours. <laughs> really. Um, well, uh, one of the most important things that I think happened because of civil rights was. Um, people sensed a sense, created a, a sense of possibility in the air. And if there's not a sense of possibility in the air, that things can, if your actions can lead to some change, most people don't bother doing anything about it. And that's where we've been for a long time, um, up until this past year, arguably. Uh, so very, you know, very significant kinds of things like Brown versus Board of Education, um, I mean, Rosa Parks, before she ever s sat in the bus and didn't move, um, went to the Highlander School where she worked in with a workshop. With Miles Horton. With Miles Horton. A workshop where blacks and whites were coming together to figure out how to tackle de integration of the South. And she said that she had never seen before in her life blacks and whites working together as equals with mutual respect. And now she saw it could happen. 
It's that idea that it can happen, and that just takes off. So media coverage was important. The image of the sit-ins was very important. I could read you some wonderful quotes from Robert Moses up north or Stokely Carmichael as a student in the Bronx, um, how they perceived the sit-ins and how that, that propelled them down into the movement, to join the movement. So the images uh, early on started to convey a meaning of things were changing, and that becomes very important today because of Occupy Wall Street, obviously. Ted, um, your book, What Really Happened to the 1960s, How Mass Media Culture Failed American Democracy, what are the roots of that for you? It, why did you write this book, and when well, did you start? Well, I actually was involved in uh, particularly the anti-war movement in the 60s, um, and sort of born a little bit too late to be in the civil rights movement, um, maybe one year too late. Uh, and I've continued to be sort You'll of... You'll still have a lot of opportunities for, to get more civil rights. Sort of, you know, I have always had a kind of an activist side to me, and, and I try to get involved mostly locally in Bethlehem, PA. Um, but uh, I wrote a book... I, I wrote a book, an earlier book, which is kind of an interpretation of the movements of the 60s. Um, it's called The 60s Experience, Hard Lessons About Modern America. And in order to get some time to start reading to do that book, I decided to teach a course on the 60s. And so I've been teaching this course on the 60s now for about 25 years or so. Where do you teach? I teach at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, PA. Um, at some point in the 80s, um, I started to get really interested in the media, and that was when the Central America stuff was going on, and I read a lot of Chomsky, and, uh, and that kind of really drove home to me how systematically the mass media distort um, the news in ways which reinforce our system. And, uh, and so at some point in there, I decided to start looking at well, you know, the media are doing that about the 60s. I, you know, Forrest Gump and, and uh, the Big Chill and, you know, that kind of thing were what the media were, entertainment media were presenting as pictures of the 60s. And you couldn't find a better match to the right-wing attack on the 60s in these commercial media. So that kind of led me to this study. Yeah. That's, it's really demythologizing, isn't it? The, Abs absolutely. I, because I, I was always pretty ticked off at the uh, the usurpation of um, political correctness yeah. by the right yeah. wing yeah. early on. Yeah. I, I recognize they're using that yeah. against yeah. what what was then fragmented left and liberal forces all over the nation as if to say we had won yeah. and that they yes, were that and we that were they the were powerful. under our right. thumb right. or under our heel. Yes. When they say, oh, political correctness is beating us over the head. We got to do multicultural. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, the drumming of the, the beat of that drum uh, did so much to yeah. uh, mythologize uh, what did go on and what was the result of uh, what was going on in the 60s, which I, of course, agree is... Um, it was underground for a while, and now it's yeah. coming back up again. It's about people power. Well, I wanted to share one thing. It's a little story about, uh -oh. Uh -oh. well, it's a good one, I think. Uh, the thing that you just said, that uh, the perception that the progressives of the left had won. Yeah. Uh, the year after the Bears won the Super Bowl, I went to the 49ers-Bears game in San Francisco where the Bears were trounced. And we I'm were so at glad it includes sports. Well, we went to sport. a bar. I was with a bunch of athletes, United for Peace, and we went to a bar, and lo and behold, we ran into an FBI agent named DeLorean. Uh, no, named Reagan. But he had busted DeLorean on that bust. He'd also gone after the weathermen. Yeah. And in the course of uh, hanging out with this FBI guy... <laughs> He said to me, he says, we thought you guys were about to win. And what came, I came away with was the, that, was that the perception it? was out there that we had accomplished more than we thought we had accomplished. Right. And clearly we had not won. We had not uh, wrested state power from the hands of the ne what became the neoliberals. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just sharing that, that the perception was real for a lot of people that we were on the brink of some really significant changes. Yeah, that would have given me chills. But it got wheeled that. back. So what do you think happened that we didn't quite make it? No. Um, one of the things I think you both touched on, which is very important, is that I think this rightist argument um, is grounded in a sense of victimization. Part of its appeal is it appeals to people who feel victimized by the world. And in fact, if you look at the Tea Party rank and file, 
a lot of those people have huge grievances. I mean, they've been losing ground in America for decades. That's right. Um, and, and so that kind of sense of victimization that these people are in power and they want to ride roughshod. I mean, there's enormous distortions in that. But the, the thing that takes it back to the 60s is the images. Because the images became a, a, the way in which the movements could, they thought, get their voice through the media. But in fact, the other characteristic of the media is that the, the, uh, the discourse, if you allow me to use that word, the academic word, the text, the words, the way the media explain what's going on um, is contained within boundaries. And those, it never goes outside those boundaries, which are sort of Democrats to Republicans, hawks to doves, uh, all reinforcing beliefs about the system or great American myths and so forth. And so what that does is that pushes the movement's arguments outside mainstream media and all the rest of the public sees or hears is what they see. And so what becomes important is appearance, behavior, numbers, and lo and behold, that's what uh, the protest movements tended to increasingly do was to sort of be uh, expressive politics is a phrase. Um, that's and, a good phrase. And, and that kind of becomes very self-isolating because yeah. if you just rely on expressing who you are visually, a lot of people out there are going to interpret it in a way that you don't want them to well, interpret that's it. All the first coverage of occupiers is was Absolutely. describing them as unwashed and Absolutely. hippies. Yeah. Um, well, you we, say in your writing, um, I'm not sure if it was in the book or in an article about Wisconsin, which we'll get to shortly, that the, the images not only attract people in, uh, to the movement, but then at a certain point they will repel or reverse things. Yes. Yes. And, when, and one of the things you point out is uh, uh, they, the media tends to focus on the images, on a few things, on the individuals, why they're there, but they don't focus on the content. They don't focus on the subject, the ideology, the reasons, the real significant criticisms of American corporate capitalism yeah. and imperialism. Yeah, they turn to uh, credible sources to interpret what, you, what you're seeing, and those credible like sources... Like Pat Buchanan. Those credible sources are the right and the Democratic Party, you know, whatever that is, the center or... Uh, and so, you, so the public never hears the arguments. I mean, the anti-war movement is a, is a classic example. The anti-war movement was saying, this is an immoral war. The United States is the aggressor. The United States is not defending democracy. And yet, doves and hawks in Congress, doves very critical of the war, nonetheless framed the war as the United States is trying to defend democracy here. So, I mean, that just does, it keeps off the agenda, off the discussion, an argument which is essential to the way a lot of millions of people saw the war. So the media inhibits democracy in Absolutely. a lot of ways. Oh yeah, I mean they're corporate media, they're not democratic media. Mass well, media, mass media. Well the, the, the specter of America over the last 20, 30 years People increasingly isolated in yes. their homes, yes. each with their own TV set, yeah. watching it alone. Watching Fox. Yeah. Watching whatever they're watching, but being inactive, disempowered. Yeah. To, um, and the, the, how that, well that works for the 1%. How well yes. that works for yes. the people on the Absolutely. Trilateral Commission. As long as we have a docile, sort of drugged thudded out populace, <laughs> we're fine. We get to do what we want to do because they're not going to challenge it. Yep. So suddenly we've got um, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah. Um, what connections do you see between the Occupy Wall Street movement and the 60s? Well, um, several, a lot actually. Uh, one is clearly um, the Occupy movement. Actually, 2011 I see as an incredibly important year and the beginning of something truly exciting and empowering, possibly. Um, and I think that it really is the first time since the 60s there's been a sustained uh, uprising of social movements, not only in the U.S., but around the world. Mm -hmm. um, there have been plenty of social movements over the years in between, and sure. I have to tell my students about those because they've never heard of those. But um, So that's important. Um, the, the spread via mass media, but also social media, very importantly. But the images, again, mm -hmm. um, invite people to say, to think, now is the time to act. And so uh, that has facilitated this incredible spread from Arab Spring to European uprisings, Latin American uprisings, to Wisconsin and Ohio, to, uh, to Occupy Wall Street, and then it's spread throughout the world. 
So that's very important. The other thing that I think is important is that, like the 60s, Occupy Wall Street is about democracy. It's about democracy is broken. Our system is not a democracy. It's a system dominated by wealth and by corporate power. Um, and in various kinds of voices, they're expressing, we're about changing that. We want to change that. We want democracy. And I think people all over the world are saying, the direction the world's going is disastrous, it can't work, it's uh, oppressing millions, billions of people. So uh, when people start to act and rise up is when um, it spreads. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that some form of Occupy Wall Street will be back in the public eye in the spring. I, I think this is a, a winter of reflection, a winter of organizing, a winter of making connections, a winter of talking to people. Absolutely. And then in the spring, it's going to get very interesting. How do you think that will play into the election? Uh, and I guess what I'm after there is, the, uh, in reading your uh, writing, I, uh, you, you talk about both Clinton and Obama being kind of centrist Democrats, that the Democrats really do play into the uh, neoliberal uh, scheme of things, even though during elections they move to the left in terms of their rhetoric and are much more populist. So uh, expound on that, how the, the Democrats really are, are pretty centrist, even though they'll give a populist rhetoric, as does the Tea Party in some ways, yeah. and how you think that's going to play out in the, uh, in the election of 2012? Well, I think it already... Occupy has already had an impact on the public rhetoric or on our discourse about things. It's, it has made what we've been doing for years um, a subject to basic questioning. It has empowered uh, politicians to speak. Yes. Obama, uh, even Mitt Romney has flip-flopped on... on uh, Mitt, the poster boy for the 1%. <laughs> the poster boy for the 1%. Flip-flopped on Occupy Wall Street. So it's given a legitimacy to a point of view that, that taken where it wants to go challenges the system. Now, the politicians are never going to go there and challenge the system until there's enough of an uprising of the public, an organized public, that makes it imperative. They will go where the vote, voters go if the voters are organized. Some of uh, what I think your book is, is a, a how-to, in some ways, how not to uh, let this happen again. In other words, the yes. co-optation, the, yeah. the, 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 the surface coverage yeah. of people standing up for their rights um, should not hap be allowed to happen again. Yeah. And, and I, you know, we have to hope history being what it is, evolution happens, that maybe that, that will be a step or two further down the road this time around. I, but Michael's question about the connection with the national politics is, I think, pertinent because you start your book by talking about Obama saying, I am not fighting the battles of the 60s. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. significant take of phrase. Mm -hmm. Because he wanted, he wanted people not to be afraid. Right. Um, right. So, in fact, though, his very presentation of hope, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, underlies the power of these young people who stood up and said, yeah, darn it, I yeah. expect democracy. Yeah. We expected yes. democracy growing up in the yeah. 50s because sure. we watched John Wayne movies. <laughs> we were empowered to be, believe that America did only good things right. in the world. Absolutely. And so yeah. there, there is a relationship. Yes. And, and how we didn't do we, know about the American nightmare, just the American not. dream. We right. absolutely, absolutely, you're absolutely yeah. right. Now we know about the nightmare, a lot of us. And mm -hmm. these kids, the young people, I give them credit for standing up, but... You're right. Wisconsin in on our soil was the first meaningful yeah. and incredibly meaningful yeah. action. Uh, I want to shout out to Paul and Mary Wozniak, who have been very involved and actually is the reason that we got you up here, Ted, was Paul's mm -hmm. connection. Um, uh, where's my question here? Well, the one question <laughs> I have that come t dovetails off of that is um, you as a teacher... Uh, you refer to some of the students not necessarily knowing certain social movements that had happened. Where do you think young people are at today? I mean, we know that in the last election or in... in not asking for a broad generalization well, or anything. In, no. uh, when Obama was elected, we clearly had a, a, a lot of young people coming out and voting for the first time. There's some talk that people are disillusioned, they may not come out. Things are, I think, will will fire up again, but how about, uh, what's your sense as a teacher in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, at Lehigh University, where these kids are at? 
Well, I think they're very disturbed by the world. I think they think things are not working. Um, I think they have felt not much I can do about it. But I think Occupy, in particular, um, has attracted a group of students. And Lehigh is a fairly, I would call it, centrist, conservative sort of place. It's not right wing. Um, but there are not many political. It'd be activists. more right wing if you weren't there. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Um, so uh, there's a. I think young people are seeing Occupy as um, maybe this is the way that we bring about change. I think there is a lot of disillusionment about Obama, and I think that the the hope that was generated by the election. I think that you know, again, it's sort of symbolism, symbolism in the media. It was a powerful moment at 11 o'clock on, on election night when he when they announced his election, and then. There was a big celebration in Grant Park, of all places. Um, powerful symbolism. I mean, it moved people to tears. Uh, yeah. A black man elected president. Um, but media savvy is so important because you have to understand it is symbolism, you know? And, and where's the reality behind the symbols? That takes work to find that reality, which takes people talking to each other, teaching each other, not just teachers in the classroom, but everybody. I so I, I think at the end of my question was that I don't want it to result like in 1968 with the election of Richard Nixon. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that's an issue. That is. It I, is I just issue. want to say one thing. I want to say you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show brought to you every Saturday morning on WLUW, Chicago Sound Alliance. You can get us anytime on uh, WLUW.org. You can see earlier editions of our show if you go to Heartland Media. No, if you go to youtube.com slash Heartland Media. And we are here with Edward Morgan, also known as Ted, and we are talking about he, he, a lot of things, but he wrote a wonderful book called What Really Happened to the 1960s. Go ahead, Kate, your question. No, I, I just basically was saying let's not elect Richard Nixon, which is, I guess, well, this, let's, let's this address year that. Is, let's not erect, elect Mitt Romney, Be uh, Newt Gingrich. One of the things that I with. read in Ted's writings was that uh, even though uh, we, th I thought everybody, when they watched the Dem 1968 Democratic Convention stuff, would be on the side of the people, that uh, by and large out there in society, an awful lot of people, more than half of the people, I don't know the numbers, did uh, basically uh, side with the police. police yeah, and that's really unique to me that sober. that happened. <clears throat> yes, and there's another quote I have in there about a young guy in the after the Watts riot saying, we won because we we made the world pay attention to us. And that's what I mean by expressive politics. It's sort of like, if we get attention to us, we are empowered and we, we, we therefore win. And it's what's a, wrong with that? There, <laughs> you haven't. Yeah. Um, and, and it's maybe a step, but you've start, got to start building community, building organizations, talking to people, uh, reaching out to other people. Uh, it, it's absolutely important that there be organizing going on. I want to uh, focus for a moment on Wisconsin, and then uh, Ted is going to read from his book. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about Wisconsin. You know, it seemed to come out of nowhere. Here you had this wonderful state, a progressive straight state with lots of uh, tradition. Uh, I always felt good about going to Wisconsin. All of a sudden, we get this turnaround with this guy Scott Walker elected the governor, and the Republicans get control of the legislature, and then people... In, you know, when he tried to take away the rights of uh, union people and public employees, uh, people reacted, and big time. Tell us a little bit about that and how, what you perceive as the media's role in that, from the Koch brothers funneling money in to how the, the more centrist media may have played into it. Just a little bit on Madison and Wisconsin. Well, I, I think it's another classic case. First of all, I think that it's an example of the group ALEC that the Koch brothers helped to fund has created a state-by-state uh, effort to transform our state governments after ha attacking the federal government. Well, that's government. key. You talk about what's been going on in the federal government is now seeping into the it's state. It's absolutely We're at the state We're taking away level. the support so that people it's get. It's an attack on the idea that government is there to be used to address public needs, common, common goods, and to help people who are in need in some manner. And it's, that's the target of all of this. Um, so there's an enormous amount of organization and money behind what happened in Wisconsin, obviously. And it happened, it's happening in Pennsylvania, where I live. It's happened in Michigan and Ohio and other places. But the response was very uh, powerful. I think they overextended. I think they went after. The problem with the state level is people can see, if you're cutting out the state level 
uh, 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 good budget point. items, people can see the impact. They say, where do those teachers go? Why are the schools so crowded? Where, why are there fewer police in Much this Much closer city? to the bone. And there are also people that they know or know of or the people like their neighbors. And so there's an easy kind of way of understanding, wait a minute. And then the attack on unions, I mean, the, the polls were uh, across the board. People supported the unions and support collective bargaining for co public employee unions. That also is a typical pattern. All of these attacks are actually counter to what public opinion generally supports. So it's really an attack on democracy. The media, um, I think the media images, the mass media images, um, helped to bring Wisconsin, what was happening They in were much gentler than some uh, uh, movement, uh, you know, demonstration images. Yes, they were, but they were sort of, um, it, they were so inspiring by right. who was there. I mean, it was a kind of a cross-section of America or middle, um, middle Midwestern America. Um, and I think that the, those images helped to inspire others um, so that, you know, what happened in Ohio, in Wisconsin happened in Ohio and Michigan and I, several other states. Go ahead. Ted, we're going to run out of time, so I want you to read that quote from your book, and then we'll have a couple of minutes to chat. Okay. I, I didn't mention how the media distorted Wisconsin, but I'll get well, back. Well, you can do it quick. Go ahead. Well, there's, I mean, I do, in this little paper you're talking about, I do talk about how... Um, Fox now plays a very important role in sort of spinning uh, the rest of the mass media's discussion of They're things. They're brilliant at it. And, and, and it's quite revealing to look at Fox's coverage. I mean, all, they virtually interviewed only Republicans the entire time that they were there. Yeah, you said there was like 44 interviews with Republicans yeah. and six with Democrats. Yeah, and so they kind of defined the, you know, the discourse about that. I want to I leave folks with a couple quotes from the book. First is Howard Zinn, um, who is greatly missed and Indeed. Familiar to you all, I'm sure. Um, Howard said, to be hopeful in bad times is not foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. Now, I end my book with a, uh, the following paragraph. In the end, the effort to build a democratic alternative to an increasingly ominous corporate future is, like many moments experienced during the long 60s era, one that can be powerfully self-sustaining. In addition to enabling people to see the forces that impinge on and repress their full humanity, it awakens in people the awareness of possibility the possibility that things can be done differently, the possibility that people of very different backgrounds and orientations can come together and discover their common humanity. The latter discovery is one of democracy's most powerful rewards, the sense of breaking through preconceptions about differentness to come to an understanding of the other that brings with it a rich emotional connection. Dang. Nice. I read that same Zinn quote on this radio show a few weeks ago. Did I did. <laughs> I, I don't know. It came to me in, the, in an email and it was so um, inspiring. Well, I, I think we're all subject to this imagery. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, oh, really, when I saw images in, as a 13-year-old yeah. of uh, people in their ch going to church clothes getting fire hosed, yeah. Um, yeah. that that was powerful. It was a wake and, up. Yeah. and when I see uh, in the coverage of Wisconsin, gray-haired folks, yes. um, people with canes, people yeah. with babies, yep. um, I'm like, yes, see, there's mm -hmm. America. It's mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. the hippie unwashed, yeah. uh, for yeah. lack of a yeah. So we are all subject to those powerful images. Yes. And the imagery that is denoted as better or worse than. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think we're going forward in, in this year, which I, I agree with you is a significant, we've got a significant thing happening. You know, we've, yeah. in Chicago, there's already a date um, to meet uh, April 7th mm -hmm. out there again to mm -hmm. uh, re-engage the Occupy and re-envision it oh, just a few weeks before the G8 and NATO come to meet here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, you looking forward to that? <laughs> I think it should be exciting, yeah. Yeah. I wish we could continue this discussion for another hour. I know that the masses out there in WLUW listening land would be really glad to, to know more. But uh, we're going to have to round up this round, round it up, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have to come to an end here. I want to thank our guests this morning. 
Ted, Ted tell me, you're in town for the history uh, confab? Yeah, I'm here to interview candidates for a position at Lehigh. Yeah, that's God, um, I love you. <laughs> next week, we've got a couple of really interesting guests. We have Rick Munoz, who is the alderman of the 22nd Ward, and he is running for another office. And uh, we also are going to have a fellow named Alan Marshall, who is the director and the producer of The March, a civil rights opera. So that's going to be kind of exciting. I don't know if he's going to bring any singers with him, but uh, we're looking forward to the civil rights opera, The March, as well as Rick Munoz next week. I want to thank everybody who's made this show possible. I, Katie's got one more thing. Would these books are here for sale right now. They could be, yeah, everybody pay attention here. You can get an autographed copy of this book, What Really Happened to the 60s, right now and hanging around for a little while in Heartland General Store will be Ted. This is a good book. This it is it's going to be useful It'll give you for a, a like lot a real of decades. sense of analysis. I want to thank uh, Angel Herrera for his on-site duties here. I want to thank Eli Sloan downtown. I want to thank Lisa Herman over in Washington, D.C., one of the producers. I want to thank Paul and Mary Wozniak, Lisa Smith, and everyone who makes this show possible. This is Michael James saying, do good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do. Katie Hogan and myself, we say over all and out, all power to the people. people.